we start with the biggest and most fearsome challenge of them all, Everest, and the first man ever to snowboard down from the roof of the world. Snowboarding and mountain sports are for most people an opportunity to get away from the routine of urban living and to have a little bit of fun at the same time. But for more and more people, it's becoming a test against nature, the elements, and ultimately themselves. But if you're gonna take full advantage of what the mountain's got to offer, it's essential that you're fully aware of the hazards and the dangers that are involved. There's no hiding the severity of conditions on Everest. Between the very first expeditions in 1921 and May 1996, 630 climbers reached the summit and 144 died, a ratio of just four to one. To date, less than a thousand people have made it to the roof of the world, and until French rider Sil Destremo launched his assault on the peak last year, no one had ever snowboarded down its terrifying faces. For Destremo, there was an extra challenge, to climb Everest unaided and without the use of oxygen. It would mean spending many hours in the rarefied air at over 8,000 meters, alone in what climbers call the death zone. I don't feel I'm doing extreme snowboarding. I, I, I mean, extreme snowboarding for me, it's jumping cliffs and going maybe in some spot without real precaution. I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know what, what sport, I, I don't think it has a name for the moment. I think it's quite a new sport what I'm, I'm doing, so I don't, I don't call that extreme. Destremo is more than just a snowboarder, a true mountaineer. He has climbed some of the world's highest peaks throughout China, Peru and Nepal. But only once has he been above 8,000 meters. It's a passion. I mean, you don't, it's just when, uh, when you start to be uh, going in altitude, you want to go higher and higher. And well, I guess the, the ultimate point is the top of the world and it's Everest. So you try to to go there and try to make it. Until a few years ago, nobody attempted to climb to the summit of Everest without the benefit of oxygen. But it is at the extreme limits of human performance. It's not at all the sort of thing to try at home. Um, and you need very extensive preparation. It is this business of waiting for the body to adapt. Professor David Dennison is one of the world's foremost experts on the effects of altitude on the human body. Without proper acclimatization, climbers lose consciousness within minutes in the cold, oxygen-starved air above 8,000 meters. Destremo had planned his climb meticulously, arriving in the Himalayas two full months before setting off for the summit. But at over three miles above sea level, even base camp on Everest is more than a thousand meters higher than any cable car can take you in Europe. The highest I've been, I've been to, I think I've been climbing at three and a half thousand meters. Every step was like, was like running a race. Every step, it's a, one step would equal 10 steps. I felt physically sick. You're twice as high as I've ever been and more. Yeah, I mean, it's, um... I think you, you can't make, uh, you can't go to altitude without preparation. And it's two kinds of preparation. It's physical preparation. So you have to run a lot. You have to be well trained for sure. That's the first point. And the second point, definitely, is that you have to be mentally prepared. I went um, with a motorbike from Sweden uh, uh, to south of Europe and it, it was snowing. You know, do stupid things like that just to to be in no, not normal conditions. And then of course it's, I mean, you have to, to, to first to reach some kind of altitude to realize how it can be. So it's not just a case of picking your route and going up there, we're talking months and months of preparation. Um, you have two weeks of uh, acclimatization to reach 5,000 meters, about two weeks. And uh, then I stayed uh, 45 days over, over 5,000 meters. And I stayed, which is not very common, I stayed uh, 12 days over 6,500 meters, which uh, normally people don't do. In the weeks leading up to his ascent, Destremo established six staging camps from 5,500 meters up to the highest at 8,300, half a kilometer short of the summit. 
the effects of mountain sickness can take hold after 5,000 meters. But the climber's worst fear is a condition called cerebral edema. In effect, liquid on the brain caused by lack of oxygen. Well, nobody would survive it um, going up abruptly. And to take anybody from sea level directly to that altitude and keep them there for uh, uh, two or three days, they'd be dead, no question. Mountain sickness is the name given to the complications of oxygen lack. A typical case of mountain sickness will be of painful breathing, blinding headache, and difficulty to sleep. And the moment any of those things appear, it's time to come down, and to come down quickly. You can get so-called cerebral edema, a soggy brain. It can only be put right by the immediate provision of oxygen. Back on Everest, Destromo was at last ready to set off from base camp. With no oxygen, his time at higher altitude would be severely restricted. So ahead of him, nearly 40 hours of climbing without sleep. I don't see the point of using oxygen. I mean, people that are using oxygen, it's just to make the summit. It's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's climbing. I think it's to go somewhere, to reach the point, but not to, not to be with the nature. I start from base camp and I try to make summit without stopping, so without sleeping. So it's just straight up. Despite the harshness of the environment, hundreds of climbers attempt to conquer Everest each year, though only a small percentage make it to the top. At the same time as Destemo, 40 other mountaineers were climbing in groups with oxygen and Sherpas on different routes to the summit. Destemo had given himself just four days to get to the top and ride down. To be at the altitude to which he went, that is a good 8,000 meters, it is inevitable that he would be stupid due to oxygen lack and it is also true having been there at those high altitudes for 35 hours he would almost certainly also have cerebral edema so the two fundamental problems of going to altitude are stupidity and weakness and they become more marked the higher you go before Destromo, there had been two failed attempts to climb Everest and ride down. Setting off with an 18 kilogram backpack of supplies and emergency equipment, the trick would be to conserve enough energy to make the first ever descent by snowboard from the roof of the world. Cyril Destemo had forced himself into the best shape of his life for his attempt to climb to the roof of the world. But even at this level of fitness, climbing across the icy waste at 6,000 metres above sea level is a slow, torturous business. And the terrain over the next 2,500 vertical metres would only get more severe. I can't imagine, you just must be so drained, so exhausted. Yes, but I mean, when, once you're exhausted, you don't feel that you're more exhausted. You, you know, it's like, it's funny, but when, when you've reached a limit, it's, I think it's the same in everyday life. When you've reached a limit, if you go further, it doesn't make much difference. So, I mean, it's just the point to reach this limit and to go further. You're much stronger than what you think. I mean, you, really, you, in your people, I think people are quite weak in their mind. And, and when you, you reach there, you really realize that you're much stronger than what you are because you're able to, to endure much more difficult things. Destromo was reaching the limits of human mountaineering and physical ability. One slip would have sent him falling hundreds of feet down cliff faces of sheer ice. This is the stark reality of Everest's death zone.
it's always a difficult moment when you, you meet uh, uh, dead people on the way that uh, were climbing with you, it's not so funny. It's a bit, it's a tough moment, but, but I mean, you, you don't realize that, uh, I mean, you want to go on. I mean, it's still in, in if, if you have the motivation, you just want to go on. It doesn't matter what happens around it. Because you, you, the tragedy are there. You don't think of this. I mean, you just have to be strong in your mind and keep knowing your limits, which is very hard because when you reach uh, 8,000, you're not yourself anymore. Without oxygen, there is no way of avoiding the effects of mountain sickness. The cold, the winds, and the altitude all play their part in making a trial of even the most basic human functions. Blinding headaches, nausea, and impaired breathing all come with the territory. Even the simple act of drinking becomes an enormous struggle. You are looking at a, an extreme human achievement. It's right at the limits of human performance. Nobody will be able to climb Everest without adaptation at a base altitude beforehand. As the oxygen supply gets less and less, so you become weaker and weaker. You cannot possibly undertake something like this without being physically very fit indeed. There's no question at all about that. But the most important thing is to be mentally fit because it's a sort of experience that would frighten and deter almost everybody. The altitude meter on Destromo's wristwatch showed a reading of just under 8,300 meters. After 35 hours without sleep, the 29-year-old Frenchman was reaching the limits of his own physical and mental endurance, with the summit tantalizingly close. At the very edge of human endeavor, the climber's instinct for self-preservation is his only true friend. Every fiber of Destromo's being was telling him to stop, though this would mean the end of his dream to reach the top of Everest. It was more than 400 meters, and uh, the last 400 meters are, of course, the worst one. I mean, it's, it's really long. It, I think it takes almost 10 hours for 400, 400 meters so it's not just it seems to be short but it's quite long anyway i never had good weather condition so i had to stop at uh, 8350 meters with the weather closing in there was only one real option for all the climbers on the mountain to head back down. The next stage, the descent by snowboard, could be just as hazardous. Extreme is an overused term in winter sports, but not on Everest. There's no doubt that the less time you spend exposed at high altitude, exposed to the oxygen lack, exposed to the high wind, exposed to the cold, exposed to the, the snow, and therefore the, the wetness, the better. And so, Climbing like this and, and descending like that is a good thing. It's better than doing that. On the other hand, it wants an abominable amount of skill to snowboard and uh, the risks of snowboarding as opposed to climbing down. I wouldn't do it for nothing someday. I don't understand why people are climbing up and going down hiking. I mean, when you go up on mountains, it's much easier to go down skiing or snowboarding. 
So, I mean, it was the purpose, it's to, uh, people maybe don't imagine that, but for me, it's safer to go down snowboarding. Of course, it's harder because I have to carry three kilos, four kilos extra. That's the hard point, especially with the wind blowing. Uh, but on the way down, I mean, it's faster, so it's safer. Because, you, I mean, you, you, you can't live over 48 hours over 8,000. I mean, you're sure to die over, if you stay more than 48 hours. So for me, it's a faster way to go down. Of course, then you have to be a bit cautious with crevasses and things like that. But you have a nice axe. So. <laughs> oh, well, it's easy then. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> no one had ever been here before on a snowboard. There is no right or wrong route down from the summit, except for the one that gets you down in one piece. Picking his way through the rocks and crevasses, Deskimo had only his mountain experience to rely on. What's it like? What are the conditions like to snowboard it's not on the, the biggest mountain in the world? Mm. Well, people would expect that it's a lot of snow, but uh, over 8,000 it's almost no snow because it's too windy. It's mainly ice. No, I would have thought you would have needed oh. one, a really long, stiff board to get down. Yeah, that's what you need, but that's not what you don't want to carry. So, you, you, I mean, you, I had a 156 board, quite wide board, because you don't have snowboard boots like I have now. You have climbing boots uh, that are made for cold, so that resist to minus 50 degrees. So you don't, or you try not to get frozen. I mean, you get a couple of frostbite, but that's all right. How far did you come down on the snowboard? You, you go down to about 5,000 meters. So it's about 3,500 meters of a, a vertical drop. But it takes two days. Destromo's painstaking progress down the mountain may have taken two days, but at least he's here to tell the story. Others taking the more conventional route didn't make it back. Here's a man who um, pushed himself to the very limit, so much so that he, he had to concentrate entirely on self-preservation. Apart from oxygen lack, uh, the other stresses are the extreme physical effort that's required to climb. You can't simply equate this with rushing up flights of stairs or anything of this sort. It's extreme exertion. The wind and the very low temperatures together is a very serious risk. I think I was okay, but I, I mean, I think I could go higher, but it was windy, so I had to stop again. The energy you want to spend is to save your life. I know a couple of people that uh, were there, and it, it was a New Zealand guy that, I mean, I was talking to him on the way up, and um, I told him, you have to go down. I think you don't feel good, you have to go down. And he says, no, no, I'm okay, I'm, I think I'm still okay. And uh, half an hour after, he was dead. So, of course, you realize things different. After four days of unrelenting effort on Everest, Sil Destromo at last made it down to base camp and relative comfort at 5,000 meters above sea level. He may not have added his name to the list of climbers who have scaled the very peak of the world's highest mountain, but in the short history of snowboarding, his is an achievement that may never be matched. What's, what's your feeling now? I just feel happy in myself to know that, uh, that I'm able to, uh, to go deeper. I think it really helps you in everyday life. For me, I mean, I, I, I never feel any problem when I, when I wait, when I have... Uh, when something's going wrong, I always feel uh, very optimistic. I always find solution. I never see any problem. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter if I if, if I don't eat today. I mean, I'll eat tomorrow. It's okay.